Senator, um, just to follow up on a couple of the issues you raised. Um, first of all, on immigration, you talk about America being the place where people can come to. Are you pleased with the way immigration has been discussed in the Republican primary? Do you think there needs to be a better affirmative uh, message? And secondly, with regard to Iran, it seems as though the president is, with all the sanctions, eager to get back to the negotiating table with the mullahs. Um, do you think that's what he's up to? And uh, how dangerous, how problematic would that be if he's only angling to get back to the table with these people? Um, I actually am pleased with the, di the direction that the Republican debate is starting to move and here's on immigration, and here's why. We are the pro-legal immigration party. And what I remind people of all the time is I have countless people that come into my offices in Florida every week who say that they have their, their parents or their grandparents or their husband or their children or someone they love is back home in another country, has applied to enter the U.S. legally, has done the background check, has filled out the paperwork, have paid their fees, and have been waiting in line for years. And no one talks about them. What about those people? What about the ones that are trying to enter America the right way? What is our message to them? And so we are the pro-legal immigration party. I think we're the party of immigration modernization, that we look at, we understand that not only is immigration part of our heritage, it's part of our future. We have to have a workable legal immigration system that works. We're not just the anti-illegal immigration party, we are the pro-legal immigration party. Illegal immigration is dangerous. It's bad for uh, the legal immigration issue. Now, listen, we have to recognize, yeah, there are people that illegally enter this country or overstay visas for the purposes of um, taking advantage of our social safety networks and so forth, but the enormous majority of people who enter this country illegally or overstay do so in search of jobs. They basically want to give their kids and grandkids whatever opportunities that they can't have. And we need to recognize that from a human aspect. But that doesn't mean we don't enforce our immigration laws. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't work to have a legal immigration system that works. So I think we've, I'm pleased that our candidates are beginning to talk about the fact that they support legal immigration. And one more point that we need to start making. Just because you don't agree with the left specific and their specific plans for immigration does not mean that you're an anti-immigrant. And we, and we should push back on that very strongly. Uh, just because you don't agree with their specific ideas on illegal immigration doesn't make you anti-immigrant. I think that's an absurd accusation that the left tries to make. And what they don't admit is that the vast majority of them are not, are, are, what they're salivating at is what they think is the political opportunity to try to give amnesty to 9 to 11 million people that will help them win elections. Senator, the White House recently appointed either a liaison or an advocate for illegal aliens, as I understand it. Just in the, have you heard that in the last day? I read that yesterday. I don't know in depth. And I, you know, I always hate to comment on things that I'm not fully aware of. I would just, but here's what I wish. I wish the, the White House would have a liaison on behalf of people that are trying to legally enter this country, about the, on the people that have done it the right way and are trying to enter the right way, and that we honor that. I mean, mm -hmm. we, I, I, we don't spend enough time and energy talking about the people that are trying to enter the country the right way. And we're, I hope they'll have a liaison for that, too. Just a follow, quick follow-up. In, in, in one of the debates, I think it was Gingrich, laid out a plan, which was kind of six steps. Seal the border, do this, do that, which allowed for an amnesty at the end. Did, did, did you, do you recall that? Do you have yeah, I do. Look, I, here's where I think everybody agrees on. We need border security. We need an electronic verification system. We need to modernize our visa program. We need some functional guest worker program that doesn't cost American <coughs> jobs doesn't lead to citizenship and then and then and then you're left with the issue of 9 to 11 million people and the answer is there is no easy answer for that uh, I don't think it can be amnesty I don't think it because you're you're be creating a precedent and a reward for people to do that in the future um, mm -hmm. but 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 that doesn't mean there might not be some other solution that doesn't lead to citizenship but my point is you can't even begin to talk about that until you deal with these other issues the, the issue of 9 to 11 million people here illegally will never be easy to deal with, but it certainly gets easier after you've done all these other things in sequence. And, and, unfor and unfortunately, there's not enough talk about that. There has to be a sequential order to this. Um, and, and so I'm not critical of this plan. I, I don't know all the details of it, to be no, honest with you. But I want to get back to Iran for a yeah, second. The Iran situation is, um, is the most immediate, obviously, threat. But there's a couple things that people need to understand. But one, Iran itself is an existential threat, not just to Israel, but to the region. Um, these, are not, these are not rational human beings who would be in charge of a nuclear uh, stockpile. The second thing we need to understand about Iran is it's not just a country that wants nuclear weapons in order to balance out some sort of regional competitor mm. or to, have, uh, to survive as a regime. This is a country that uses terrorism as part of statecraft. I mean, it's part of their foreign policy. 
it would remind us that just a couple months ago we uncovered a plot to assassinate ambassadors in this very city run by Iran. So these are, these are people that, if they're willing to assassinate ambassadors, who's to say they're not willing to share weapons of mass destruction technology with terrorists to detonate here in the homeland and around the world? The second thing is, if Iran were to acquire a nuclear weapon, it would immediately be followed by an arms race in the region. Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, some of the kingdoms would all immediately begin to work on their own nuclear ambitions um, because they would need to be able to balance out uh, the, 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 the Iranian nuclear capacity. As far as the president's approach to it, I would say that in the first year in office, he made some decisions that I think set us back. Uh, the New Year's video for YouTube to the Iranian people standing by and saying nothing while young people took to the streets to protest a fraudulent election in the hopes that somehow, you know, I think he had this naive belief that the stuff these professors would talk about at the universities was true. That the reason why Iran was mad at us is because we were mean to them. And, uh, and if we were just nicer to them, they'd come around. I think over the last couple years, uh, being in the position that he's in, he's come to the realization that these are actually very evil human beings who have specific designs about not just regional domination, but, but increasing their influence around the world. And as a result, has had to get more stringent in terms of um, some of the um, um, decisions that have had to be made in terms of sanctions and things of that nature. So, look, I. I the ideal scenario would be for Iran to wake up tomorrow morning and decide, you know what, the price of acquiring a nuclear capacity is too high, um, we're going to walk away from it. And it, you should always be prepared for that. But I don't think we should hold out a lot of hope that that's going to happen. I think we have to have a combination of <coughs> crippling sanctions, the, in, in ratcheting up the pressure on the sanctions, and be prepared uh, to leave all options on the table beyond that, uh, as, as, un, as, as distasteful as that may be. Um, the idea of Iran becoming a nuclear power, weaponized nuclear power, is so catastrophic that there's virtually, virtually no price too high to pay. You said that you felt that, that President Obama had come around on Iran. Have you met with him, and no. do you have a sense of what kind of man he is in terms of like the, the Catholic thing, how he views the world? I don't know him at all. I mean, I, I think I shook his hand one time at a some picnic at the White House lawn, and I met him one other time at the, the World AIDS Day thing event, and, and I think I've met him three times, and I talked to him on the phone for 30 seconds a week after I got elected. I don't know him at all. He looks like a really good dad and a really good husband and a really bad president. There's a report out that the president was at a retreat with fellow Democrats. He's doubling down on these HHS mandates, yeah. uh, violations of the First Amendment. I know you've been part of the charge against it in the Senate. How do you see that playing out? It seems like there's some Democrats peeling off. Uh, do you think that there'll be a, a legislative action anytime soon coming out of Congress to fix this? Well, first of all, he's got his problem in his own party. It sounds like if there was a President Biden, he wouldn't have done this because it sounds like Vice President Biden and the outgoing Chief of Staff both told the President not to do this. Uh, what basically at the core, this is not about contraception, it's not about, this is about a constitutional right that, of religious expression and religious freedom in the United States. And here's the question that we need to answer. Do we believe that the federal government should have the power to force a religious organization to pay for something that the religious organization teaches is wrong? And if the federal government has the power to do that, then we are, going to, we are living in a very scary place because of, in, in terms of the violation of our constitutional rights. That's what this issue is about. I, don't think the, I think ultimately this will be overturned in the court, but I hope we don't have to wait that long. So here's the ideal scenario. The ideal scenario is that the president comes to his senses and says, you know what, we've heard from a lot of people, maybe this is gone in a direction we didn't intend, and basically changes his mind. If he doesn't do that, I don't think we have a choice but to act congressionally. Uh, just today I filed an amendment to the transportation bill with Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, a Democrat who believes this is an overreach. I think over the last 24 hours we've heard from a Senate, uh, Senator, uh, Senate candidate in Virginia who's against it. We've heard of some Democrats in the Congress who are against it. We've heard from, I think Joe Lieberman tweeted that he was against it. We, 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 uh, I think uh, Ben Nelson has said he's against it. Um, you'll have to confirm all this, but uh, I, I think uh, Senator Casey has said he's against it. This is not a partisan issue. This is not even a left versus right. This is a constitutional issue. And whether we now have a president and an administration that believes that, that they think their policy ideas are so important that they trump the First Amendment of the Constitution. Senator, are you, hey. Hey. Are you saying that uh, the president wanted to go ahead and do, did this over the heads of his advisors, his closest advisors, uh, and push this on his own? Well, I don't know who his closest advisors are. I don't. Well, I he's the vice president. Well, and I, 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 Bill I, I, that the news reports, and I'll leave it up to them to deny it. But the the news reports I read 
um, and we all know that whatever is on the news is true, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that Joe Biden and Bill Daley both told the president not to advise against this um, from both a political and a policy perspective. And um, so maybe should, someone should ask the vice president whether he agrees. Uh, Senator, follow up. Um, your bill is narrowly focused on contraception and sterilization procedures, correct? Um, there has been some calls for a broader bill, National Review Today, as an editorial, saying that it should be about any moral objection. Um, was there a reason to focus it narrowly around contraception and sterilization, or has it been revised to include things like a? a no, I'm for a broader approach to it, okay. but we can get, but we have to pass it. Okay. And in the Senate, you need 60 votes, okay. and so I'm for the broadest approach that we can pass. Okay. There's no, and, and, and I'm a co-sponsor of that approach, okay. but um, but ultimately, I don't just want a show vote here. I'm not interested in having a vote here that we can use on the election circuit. I'm interested, and in, in ultimately, that may be what it becomes, but. I'd rather have a result. I'd rather be able to undo this thing. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, if someone, if, we, if, the, if the other approach, the broader approach, which I, which I support and I think is a better policy approach, can get the votes uh, to pass, um, I'll be for that. Do you have any sense whether your vote could, your bill could get 60 votes? Have you... I think, uh, well, I don't even get to 60, but, but we're working on it. But I, I feel increasingly confident that we'll have a significant bipartisan support for it. And if we can do that for the broader approach, then I'm for the broader approach. Mm -hmm. In this election, there's been a lot of talk in the last year that this is really going to be focusing on the economy, on, on jobs, uh, and that there's been sort of a, we had Mitch Daniels, for instance, say we should call a truce on social issues. Doesn't this really put, so, I mean, doesn't it almost uh, give Republicans an entree to say, well, we didn't want to talk about social issues, we wanted to talk about economy and the jobs, but this administration is so yeah. radical that we have to talk about this? Well, first of all, I don't think social issues ever go away because you can't have a strong country and you can't have a strong economy if you don't have strong people. And the way you get strong people is family and the, and the institutions of society that help families raise strong uh, people of good character. And, and that includes churches, synagogues, faith-based organizations, and the like. That being said, I don't believe this debate ultimately is a social issue. This is not about whether contraception is right or wrong. Um, this, is, this is about a constitutional principle. And we live in a country where we have a Supreme Court justice saying that somehow the South African Constitution is better than ours. This is a person whose job it is to apply the Constitution of the United States. Um, I would imagine if I were an appellate lawyer, I, I, you better brush, and you're appearing before the U.S. Supreme Court, you better brush up on your South African law <laughs> if you want to vote on your issues. I mean, so uh, that's a reality here. And if, if she was somehow some isolated point of view, um, that'd be one thing. But I think she actually represents the point of view of a lot of people in the U.S. government today who view the Constitution as an annoyance, that, that something that's annoying that they need to figure out clever ways to either reinterpret or get around. And that's pretty dangerous if we get to that point. Um, the Constitution has worked really well for the United States. I mean, it just has. We are the freest, most prosperous people in human history. Um, why would we want to stop following it? 